Today's video is brought to you by Candid. Hey brother! Guys, one of my favorite episodes of Avatar is Sokka's Master. It's the rare episode that focuses on the non-bending Sokka. His trials to become a master swordsman, forge his own sword, and find a way to stand out as a warrior in a group of people who can literally do elemental magic with martial arts. It's just one of those episodes that elevates the entire show and makes it so great. Because like, it would be so easy to just skate over this character development. I mean, it's already the final season. We already know Sokka really well. And it's not like he's useless at all. I mean, by now he's proven himself to be a formidable warrior and more importantly, like a master strategist who everyone turns to to come up with the plans. Why are you all looking at me? You're the idea guy. Plus, he's the funny one. And who keeps us laughing with sarcastic comments all the time? And yet, he can't bend. And there's just no getting around how useful bending is in this show. I mean, it is the superpower we keep coming back for. In fact, the entire first season of Legend of Korra deals with this exact issue. The feeling of inferiority of being a non-bender in a bending world. So it's totally natural for Sokka to feel left out, which is why I'm so happy he gets this episode, and even more importantly, his sword, because let's face it, it is a pretty awesome space sword. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but it's black, and that makes it awesome. I mean, Ben surprise ordered black silverware for the office the other day, and it's awesome. Like, imagine this, but a sword, or I, I, you know what? Better yet, hold on. I got it. Imagine this, but black. Can you guys guess what this is from? It's Name of the Wind. You should totally read it. This thing is like no joke sharp. But the reason Sokka calls it his space sword and the reason it's black is because he forges it out of a meteorite that falls earlier in the episode. But let's talk about the meteorite because as much as I love this episode and as much as I love that it ends up being the final thing that gets turned into the sword, it always just sort of felt super random to me. Like how convenient that it just so happened to fall earlier that episode. Like, you guys really went out of your way to give the sword a cool gimmick, didn't ya? You? You've never not seen anything like this. But guess what? It turns out the meteorite is not random at all, and the backstory behind it will blow your mind and probably break your heart a little bit. Today, we discuss the space sword. Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Candid. Guys, are you ever unhappy or self-conscious about your smile? Because the great news is you don't have to be. Candid can help. They offer clear, comfortable, removable aligners that are practically invisible. I personally had braces as a kid, but I also could use some correction on the teeth front because I didn't listen to the orthodontist and wear my retainer every day and then my dog chewed it up and I was like, well, I'm not going back. This is just like Sharon H from Pittsburgh minus the dog and not listening to her orthodontist. She says, I wore braces as a teenager. Flash forward 30 years, I had crowding on the bottom and one of my teeth actually stuck out. That's when I made the decision to move forward with Candid and I finally got my confidence back. And the great thing about Candid is that the orthodontist who sets up your aligners sticks with you through the entire experience. So you never have to wonder, how am I doing? Most treatments last just six months, but you'll start seeing results way before then. And these cost thousands less than traditional braces. So become your best you and start straightening your teeth today. Right now, you can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit when you go to candidco.com slash SCB and use promo code SCB. Again, that is candidco.com slash SCB, code SCB. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 off of your Candid Starter Kit. One more time, candidco.com slash SCB, promo code SCB, link is the description down below. So, how did Sokka end up with a black space sword? Well, the story actually begins, as I'm sure you were expecting, way back in the early 1900s with this guy, Robert Perry. Robert Perry was an American explorer who was trying to be the first person to ever reach the North Pole. But what he's actually famous for is maybe being the first person to ever reach the North Pole. See, technology wasn't quite as advanced back then. They couldn't use like satellite tracking or anything. And you can't even just use a compass and follow it north because magnetic north is actually a different pole from the actual North Pole. Look at this, you guys. We paid the science and the history budget this month. 
<laughs> which can only mean you can expect some terrible math in the future, but it, I think it was worth it. But back to the North Pole. Even if you manage to find it without technology, it's hard to prove that you found it. I mean, it's not like getting to the top of the mountain where you were very clearly at the top of a mountain or like very clearly being on the moon. The North Pole is only a feature because we say so. Otherwise, it's just a spot in the middle of an Arctic wonderland. But of course, by wonderland, I mean wasteland. It is nothing but a deadly, cold, icy, windy wasteland. I think I might have said wasteland one too many times in that last sentence, but I really want to hammer it home. It is, you don't want to go there. Not only that, but the opportunity to go up there and freeze your butt off in the middle of nowhere while you search for a coordinate that nobody's ever found before is extremely expensive. So your opportunities are limited, which also means then you're just highly incentivized to lie about succeeding because again, who's gonna prove you wrong? Unrelated, I recently just got back from the moon and I took pictures and it was awesome, look. Now, that being said, I'm not saying that Robert Perry's plan was to lie about finding the North Pole or that he wasn't actually trying to find it, but whether or not he did is still up for debate today. He was actually credited with this accomplishment for quite some time, but modern day reviews of his journals have re-sparked the debate and we may not ever know. Personally, I have trouble giving him the benefit of the doubt, but it has nothing to do with his journals or his skills as an explorer, but really just because he's not a super great dude. But don't worry, more on that right now. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering, how does Sokka fit into all of this? But don't worry, I promise you, we are getting there. See, seeking out the North Pole was not the only thing Perry did whilst he was poking around the Arctic. He was also interacting with the indigenous people and was on another quest to discover the source of their mysterious metal tools. The people in question here are the Inuits. That's Inuit, I-N-U-G-H-U-I-T, which as far as I can tell is pronounced the same way, but if you can correct me, please do so in the comments. This particular group though is also known as the Smith Sound Inuits or the Arctic Highlanders. They are located in Greenland and are notably the northernmost group of Inuit people in North America. Now you might be wondering, why would any group of people settle in what has to be a really harsh climate to live in? But the answer to that mystery was actually solved by another explorer by the name of John Ross. Ross predated Perry by about 80 years. He was a member of the British Navy and had been sent on a mission to discover the Northwest Passage, which would be a shorter trade route between Europe and China. But on his journey, he became the first European in 500 years to encounter the Inuits. And he had the same question. Why are you living here? And it turns out they had traveled to the region centuries ago to take advantage of a unique source of iron. The iron was used to make harpoons and knives and other tools which were far more reliable than the wood or bone or stones they had been using before that. And I bet you can guess what the mysterious source of iron was. Yes, a meteorite. Three of them, actually or one that broke apart anyway. And although they actually told Ross where it was, bad weather and stormy seas kept him from ever investigating the matter, but he did include the information in his logs and guessed that the source must be a meteorite. Which I have to say, really good guess. Now, even though he turned out to be right, it was only a guess. And at the time, natural history museums were extremely interested in meteorites, so, the hunt was on. This is just the sort of thing an explorer who needs to prove himself so that he can fund his attempts to find the North Pole can latch onto. And so Robert Perry enters the fray. And yes, he finds them, but not just outright. He actually asks some of the Inuit people where they are. And one of them agrees to show him in exchange for, at least according to one source, a gun. Great. Even so, it's still a 10 day journey to find the meteorites, but they do find them and then Perry takes them. Well, I say take, but let me be clear. They are extremely heavy and this was a three year process. The three meteorites though are named respectively the dog, the woman, and the tent. Of the three, the tent was the largest one, although it got renamed by Perry to Anigito after his daughter's middle name. It took him a while to get that one, but on his first journey, he did manage to bring back the three ton woman. Getting the other two took a little bit more doing. As I said, it took three years. The tent actually weighs 34 
tons and they actually had to build a small railroad to move it. And bear in mind as this is happening that the Inuit people moved to this region specifically because of the meteorites. I mean, the meteorites advanced them from the Stone Age to the Iron Age. But hey, at least Perry was able to sell them to the American Museum of Natural History for a cool 40,000, where they are actually still on display. Like you can actually go see them. I say that like I'm surprised. Like of course they're still on display. It's a 34 ton rock. How are you gonna move it? The point is losing the meteorite is a really big deal to the Inuits because it was their greatest natural resource. Is natural resource the right word? Extraterrestrial resource? Yeah, I guess that's right, right? It's a space rock and they were using it. And the meteorites are not all he took. He also asked six of the Inuit people to come back with him to America to be studied. And in exchange for this, he told them he'd bring them back in one year's time with guns and tools and grand gifts. Which doesn't sound like super fair trade to me, but six Inuit people did come back with him on the boat to New York. And when they got there, they actually remained on the boat for another 10 days while 20,000 people paid 25 cents each to come look at not just the meteorites, but the people. Yep. After that, they were moved to the museum itself where they lived in the cellar and eight months later, four of them had died due to tuberculosis. I warned you it might be heartbreaking. We're not even there yet. Cause yeah, it gets worse. One of the guys who died was the father of one of the survivors, a young boy named Minnick. Minnick was then adopted by a staff member of the museum, a guy named William Wallace. And despite being an orphan in a brand new country that he was extremely unfamiliar with, things seemed like maybe they were starting to look up for Minnick until he learned that the museum had faked his father's funeral, by which I mean they had in fact not buried his body, but instead a log wrapped in a cloth wearing a mask and his actual bones ended up in their collection, which they refused to give back to Minnick upon request. Oh, it is seriously like one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. In case you're wondering though, Minnick does eventually make it back to Greenland, but it's not for like another 12 years since his original departure. Also, I probably don't have to tell you this, but Perry did not actually deliver on his promise to bring back the gifts a year later. Honestly, it's like a really sad and nuanced story. If you wanna read more about the whole thing and get all the details, I've included links to all of our sources in the description down below. It is seriously, quite the rabbit hole. But for now, let's shift gears back to Avatar and Sokka's sword. The water tribe in Avatar, as I'm sure you're probably aware, is broadly based on Inuit culture. And Sokka's sword is pretty obviously inspired by this exact story, except in reverse. In real life, the technologically advanced Robert Perry arrived in Greenland and promised riches and weapons and then stole the meteorite from the indigenous people. In Avatar, however, it is Team Avatar, who is one half members of the Southern Water Tribe, who are secretly hiding out in the more technologically advanced Fire Nation. And it is them who steal the meteorite and then later turn it into a weapon to help defeat the Fire Nation. Ah, it is just like so extremely poetic and such an excellent explanation for the meteorite in Avatar. At the end of the episode, Sokka reveals to his master Pian Dao that he is not actually of the Fire Nation and Pian Dao in turn reveals that he already knew this. He knows that Sokka is from the Water Tribe. You might want to think of a better Fire Nation cover name. Try Lee. There's a million Lees. But he explains that he decided to teach him anyway because the way of the sword doesn't belong to any one nation. Just because Pian Dao lives in and grew up in the Fire Nation does not mean that his knowledge belongs to them. Which I feel like is also really similar to the meteorite itself. Like it fell from space and landed on Earth and the Inuit people used it, but they never claimed it was theirs. Robert Perry Perry, on the other hand, does claim it is his. He literally takes it and sells it to profit himself. And yeah, now you can go see it in person. But was it worth the cost? of it being there? Which is honestly probably just a good question to ask for any given thing in a museum because I have a feeling this story isn't totally unique, although it might be the heaviest one, physically 
and emotionally. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe by clicking that button so you don't miss any future Avatar content from us. If you want to know the real reason Azula's fire is blue, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.